Welcome to the McCombs Leadership Forum, a conversation with today's leaders about contemporary leadership issues. I'm George Gao, host of the forum, and a professor in the McComb School of Business, as well as the, a former dean of the school. The purpose of these forums is to help our students learn more about the joys and challenges of being a leader. This forum is part of a course I teach at the McComb School on ethical leadership. And here in our audience are students in my class, as well as other students in the McComb School. And later in the forum, they'll have an opportunity to ask questions of our guests. The McComb School is very proud of the ethical and successful business leaders that are graduates of our school. In fact, few business schools have as many CEOs uh, that are graduates as we do. And today, our guest is a great example of our, the graduates who have gone on to successful and ethical business careers. Joining us today is a 1969 BBA and MBA graduate of the McComb School of Business who currently serves as the chairman and CEO of ConocoPhillips, Jim Mova. Jim, great having you with us. Always good to see you. Okay. Uh, after graduating from McCombs and serving as a naval officer, you joined Phillips Petroleum in 1973 in finance-related functions, rising up to become CFO in, in 1990. Our first guest at our first forum, Gary Kelly from Southwest Airlines, also was CFO before he went on to become CEO. And in, many surveys have found that in American companies, CEOs often come from the ranks of CFOs. What is it about finance training and uh, responsibilities that prepare someone to become a CFO, CEO? Well, I think uh, probably if you're the financial side of the business, uh, you definitely have an interest in the business venture, whatever it may be, whether it's an oil company or an airline. And on the financial function, you really do have to learn and know the business, maybe not technically or how to operate it. So you just get a general interest in it. And also in a, in a business like we have, it's a, in some degree it's high technology, but it's also a mature business. And I think you create the greatest value for the shareholders when you put a good financial team together and plan and strategy with a good operating and investment strategy together. So I've always felt that a company can really complement and grow and develop and create value for its shareholders by having a good financial and investment strategy, and they support each other. And it's, all, it's not unusual to see in a company a, a teamwork of an operating type with a lot of technical and operating background with a financial type. And uh, that fits Petro uh, Phillips Petroleum. Your COO comes from more of an operating background? Normally it does, and in my case, I went from CFO to CEO but I spent five and a half years as chief operating officer, and I can remember several board members that said, well, you've demonstrated to have a reasonable knowledge and capability as being on the financial side, CFO. If you're going to move on, ultimately, to be the CEO, get out of the financial side and really immerse yourself on the chief operating side and really immerse yourself and really learn the operation side, mm -hmm. because that will help and serve you should you at some point in time become the CEO, and it really did. It was a great experience. You became CEO of Phillips Petroleum in 1999, and then became CEO of the combined company in 2002 after the merger with Conoco. I know my students here would like to know what you consider to be the most important factors that have led to your success, and of course we all hope you say graduating from the Cone School of Business <laughs> is one of them. Well, yeah, I think, uh, you know, many, in many respects, I remember a very long time ago when I first uh, went to school and uh, had really some very important people in your, your life, several that are mentors, and said some of the three very most important decisions you make in your life is where you go to school. Because where you go to school has a lot to do with what you're going to study and what you get interested in. Uh, and not everyone, but who you marry has a lot to do with it. And then essentially the organization of the company that you join. And so I think the question you're asking is, well, to what degree is successful or uh, how, what you attribute that to. And I think uh, obviously you have to have a reasonable amount of knowledge and capability and intelligence with respect to, to the business. But I think it really does come down to ultimately you've got to have a real interest in the organization, a real passion for what you are doing. And you couple that, that passion with, uh, with a, a reasonable amount of uh, success and being part of teams and doing projects and getting experience and exposure, 
But um, I would have to say, uh, sure, obviously, it's got a reasonable amount of capability and knowledge, but it really comes down to a passion and interest in what you're doing. Yeah, let's talk about passion, because we hear that often. Uh, I know I have in visiting with people this fundamental idea that a leader needs to have passion about what they're doing. What is that about? I mean, why is that important for people to feel that? Well, the higher up you go in an organization or a company, and then ultimately, let's say you, you, you become the chairman and the CEO. I mean, everyone is watching and taking a, a cue to some extent off the CEO of the company. And so it, I think the passion is so important. You really believe in what you're doing. And in my case, I've worked for the company now 36 years. I believe not just ConocoPhillips, but the industry that I work for is a very noble industry. I know in the public domain there's a lot of question about that, but we wouldn't have our standard of living that we have or the development of our economy if we didn't have energy and develop it. It's not understood by the public really well, but I believe I work in probably, the, I think, the most interesting industry in the world. It has politics, it's huge technology, billions of dollars of investment, and it's so important and it becomes intoxicating. So I really like the industry I'm in and I work in. And I think what's also important, what really drives you is passion if you believe in it. But the other side of it is work pretty hard, but uh, play to win. It's a very competitive business, always has been very competitive. And so the thrill is always the thrill of the win, the thrill of the chase. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're working on something that's really important mm -hmm. for society and for, for the development and growth of mankind and standard of living and whatever. But what the real thrill of it is, is uh, the chase. You've been involved with many other CEOs of both energy companies and non-energy companies. Is that a common trait you've seen in, in successful leaders, a fundamental passion for their business and what they're doing? Well, I think so. Uh, obviously, I do. I mean, any organization, whether you're CEO of ConocoPhillips or some other organization or company, uh, I, I really don't think you can be really successful if you don't have a real interest and really a passion and want to do it because people are really great reads of what, what's going on. And to be really uh, reasonably successful, uh, you, you've got to create, you've got to like people. You can have passion, you can have knowledge and, experience and, and intelligence, and you can have a lot of passion, but you have to like people. Mm -hmm. And you like to want to work with people and develop relationships because the way you're gonna win is not just with intelligence and, and brain power and money, you're really gonna win with people sure. and your team. Sure. And, and that's really thrilling when you go after the chase of how you grow and develop a company, but you have a team of people that do it. That's what the, that's what the thrill is all yeah. about. Most, both of us come from a finance background, so analytical numbers oriented, but yet there's this behavioral side of being a leader. How, how did you acquire those skills or what helped you develop those skills uh, that, to become a leader and, and from the understanding people and working with people well? Well, I don't know how to say that because it, when you kind of comment and respond to a question like that, you, you're always worried about coming across maybe egotistical or arrogant or whatever. But I think it's, in, it's just built in you. Are you a competitive kind of person? Uh, for myself, I, I really love the work that I do. Uh, I hate to lose. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very competitive. We, we try to set very high standards for ourselves and uh, in our company and our organization. Uh, but I think it's a common trait. I think it's kind of, you say, well, you need how to learn how, that, how to do that. It's kind of like in athletes or sports, whatever you say. You need to learn how to acquire the spirit of wanting to run faster and try to win. You either have it or you don't. So very it. innate. It's something yeah, that I you're born so. with. I, I think so. And, uh, not something necessary to, uh, that people you acquire. Don't I don't think you teach it in a classroom. But the other thing that does help is you can be with a small group of people in an organization and a team and you can really not only make good and better decisions, but you can really build a stronger organization mm -hmm. and push, raise the bar higher and higher. And you, it's incredible what you can achieve as yeah. a group. Terry, how would you describe your leadership style? I mean, if you were trying to describe it, what are the characteristics of how you approach it? Well, one of the things I would say is the, the further up you go in an organization, it, the time commitment is pretty strong. And, uh, I don't mind saying this, uh, my total commitment is to the company. I love it. Uh, it is truly 24 seven because it's a pretty large company. Uh, our revenues are fortune five. I think we're number five and we're operating 40 countries. We have many refineries, offshore platforms and I can tell you that there's always something going wrong. <laughs> when I say going wrong, 
a refinery has to go down for some reason, it lost power, or offshore there's a hurricane or a typhoon and we've got to change things. It's, it, you want everything to go perfect, but it doesn't. And so it's, I don't know exactly, I come back to your question was, uh, which, you know, okay. Leadership style. How, oh, how, leadership style. Well, so what I do is, you know, I work really 24 seven all the time, it's my life, and, and I really enjoy it, and I guess I'm very intense. I get that a lot from people, very focused, you know, and want to win all the time. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I get back from people is, you, you know, slow down just a little bit, hold up a bit, take time to celebrate. Okay. You push, sometimes you push too hard, demanding too much, but, you know, I, I think that, that probably, I'd, I'd rather see that in myself and the organization people pushing harder, doing things in the right way, than to say, come on, come on, we gotta get going, we gotta get going, the competition's pretty tough out there. We may lose this opportunity. So really, a lot of leadership by example. So how you behave, it's trying a, to pass down it's to a, others. It's a culture. It's a cultural organization. You don't just kind of work hard and say, well, we did our best, and that's good enough. Say, no, 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 no. We set the goals, and you know, with intense focus, and we get there. So, kind of, so how are you motivated? I mean, is it motivation obviously the success of the company and how it moves forward, but what else motivates you? What, what do you get joy out of as part of the job? Well, I, I get a lot of satisfaction in, in, and when we talk, I'm sure you get this in the, in the business school, in undergraduate or graduate. I can recall sitting down with our board of directors when I moved from uh, president of Phillips to chairman, or CEO and chairman. <coughs> and said, look, one of the things that's very important in the organization is not to say, okay, the next, we look over the next five years, we did this, we bought this, we acquired that, we invested here, and after five years, we say, well, look what we accomplished. We say, well, we didn't, we, okay, we accomplished that, but what, that's not what we want. What we want is what do we want the company to look like five years from now and 10 years from now? What's the vision and the plan? So it's all about what we're going to create so that everything that we do when we invest organically or we buy a company or we buy an asset, it's got to fit the plan. So the real thrill is winning. The real thrill is you know, growing and developing the company. But it's what you create. And when sure. I say create, sure. you create, it's probably like a, a writer or a scientist or whatever. It's what, how, how do we grow and develop this organization, this company? And frankly, I've been fortunate, I've been in kind of management, say treasurer of the company or vice president and CEO for quite a while, but you're really in the context of decades. You're only around for a rather short period of time. So you're part of a team, you're a custodian. Mm -hmm. And what you want to do is nurture it, grow it, and pass it on as a group to the next, to take it on to the next next. Yeah. So the real thrill is winning, obviously, but the thrill is what are we creating? Where are we going? And always having a plan. And then really push to get it done. People would ask me when I was dean, what, what is my job? I'd say it's really three things. It's strategy, resources, and relationships are the three mm -hmm. things. If you were asked that question to define your job, what are sort of the three key factors? Well, obviously, you probably hit on them. I mean, they, in any kind of organization, you, you just as whether a dean or in the classroom, you have to have a reasonable amount of intelligence and knowledge so that you can teach and, and do, do the position. But then what comes with it is uh, you know, the passion and making reasonable or good investment decisions, but it's, it's growing and developing the team. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't, we're, our success is built on technology and our people. We're gonna win with technology and our people. But then the other thing that's important is you really have to develop relationships. It's not just with the team, but it's like in China or Russia, or wherever you go in the world, you, can't, you just can't show up once a year and have that country think that you're, you're interested. You've got to go every three weeks, every four weeks, because there's eight other companies doing the same thing. So how do you sell the company? How do you sell the, real, the culture of the organization? Because they have choice. Mm -hmm. And there's so much competition for access to resources. I'm sure it's in other industries. So what's unique about the company? And they want to look at it and say, well, this person might not be here, but the culture of the organization, five years, 10, 20 years from now, I know how this company and this organization is gonna work. Yeah. So culture is so important. I, so it comes down to good investment decisions, having good resources, having financial resources, but it is the people, it is a technology, and I've grown over time that the, 
the importance of putting in place the culture is so important because we are a company that's been created over the last 10 years through mergers and acquisitions. And so you're taking cultures from many orders. That's, that's a difficult process, but so important. How do you, how do you work that? I mean, I, you know, as you think you're about working your, hard. How, you, you think about your communication strategy, how you communicate with your employees and the messages you want to get out. How do you think through that? Of how do I de further develop this culture that we want to have? In the I think the most, one of the most, you, could, you do it frequently. You do it at every level and be completely transparent. And you have to be consistent. And you can't be going this way one week and that way another week. You can't be everything's the greatest thing in the world this week and you're down the dumps the next. You have to have consistency and you know there are, there are times that things just don't go the way you want but you gotta just keep, keep on going. And so I think that's what's, what you have to do. Okay, you know, you know there's a lot of debate especially going on with financial services company about compensation. How important is compensation in motivating people versus other things? Well obviously compensation it's important. Uh, it's not important for me for what I do. So I make the final comments. That doesn't change my standard of living if my compensation goes up or it goes down. And that is not what drives me. And if that's what drives you, then you're probably in the wrong business. And then how do you instill in others? If you're really working for just money, then you're not instilling the right compensation and the right culture in the organization. And the other comment that I would say is I think it's very important. I know my wife and myself, we look at it. Uh, we, we will probably, in the end, have a home when, when retirement time comes, have a home in Texas and a, one other place somewhere else. And uh, we don't, the world's been good to us. We've been you know, reasonably successful and great health and great family. And so I think it's very important for us that you need to give back mm -hmm. because that's, sure. and that's how we look at it. Yeah, who, who do you, you know, other leaders, who do you admire? You, you know, you've run across many both political leaders in this country, other countries. You've seen other business leaders. Are there any that just strike you as great examples of what you consider to be excellent ethical leaders? Well, there's, there's, there's quite a, a number of them, and obviously there are people that you've worked at, whether it be on the board of directors or the political types or whatever. But I'll, I'll probably sur will surprise you a little bit what I'm going to say, and maybe not so much. Um, my wife and I are from Green Bay, Wisconsin. We are the ultimate cheeseheads. <laughs> the real thing. So it's Vince Lombardi. <laughs> and we grew up during that period of time, and she went to school with Vince's daughter. and just It's think, a great example. No, yeah, no. Yeah. But, I, my students, of course, don't know who that is, but still, it's oh, a great example. Most people know who he was, but, you know, he, I can remember, he, he I know a lot of his quotes, you know, and use them a lot. He, he would say things like, get up and say, there are three important things in your life, your God, your family, and the Green Bay Packers, not necessarily in that order. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then another one that he, he said that was really good, and he started off very early on, and it applies to any organization. He says, what we are going to do is we're going to strive for perfection, knowing full well that we won't achieve it, but in the process, we will attain excellence. Yes. And I'm not remotely interested in being second. It's that competitive instinct, yeah. so strong. Yeah. 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 But do yeah. it right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's talk about it. Yeah. leading a multinational company, because I think there's a lot of interesting issues um, involved with that. As you said, you're involved in uh, over 30, maybe 40 countries now, operations that you have going. Over, I checked over 33,000 employees now work for clinical folks worldwide. Uh, many of those employees are not Americans. I assume they're native to their country. And of course, countries differ in what they consider to be ethical behavior. And different cultures have different uh, standards and different expectations. But of course, you at clinical folks want to have one ethical standard. How do you deal with that and how do you uh, enforce and create a common ethical culture within a multinational company? Well, maybe there's two responses. First, we, we started off as we are an American company. I think it's very important that we are not, and, and we're moving, and we're not an American company with international operations. We're an international com company headquartered in America. And what's that saying is, the war for talent and getting talent, we need to diversify and get our talent from all over the world. And we believe strongly through diversification that we will create a stronger 
a more competitive uh, human resource uh, in the company and will make better decisions, and, and that's really important. So, but when it comes down to ethics and, and how do you instill that, I think it's the culture of the organization and the old saying, it, stop, it starts from the top down and every part of the organization got to stress it. When I talk about this, the culture of the, the organization, ethics is very important, but safety. I mean, we deal with high pressure, high temperature, oil, gas, materials, and so we stress safety. If any employee in the organization doesn't like what they see safety, they can shut it down. And, and that's very important to instill that culture. Sure. And when we come to ethics, there's no tolerance for any irregularities of financial reporting or any, anything that would go towards theft or fraud or ethical things in that regard. Sure. Now, we have all the with things and safeguards put in place. We have uh, training for all of our employees that's very routine to make sure that they see and recognize this. But then there's, a, there's no tolerance. Let me give you, there's no tolerance policy. If there's substance abuse, you're not going to work for the company. If there's ethics issues, not going to work for the company. Because it finally comes down to, I believe this, we want the culture in the organization. I want to work for a company that wins. It's successful. Mm -hmm. I don't want to work for a company that it's kind of always on the fringes. I, I want to work for a company that's safe. And I want to work for a company that the communities want us to be in. And uh, I want to work for a company that's uh, ethical. Mm -hmm. So you, you've got to talk it. You've got to walk the talk. Yeah. Example. I mean, yeah. you, you set the example as the CEO. Yeah. And how you behave is what people look and, to. And you better be consistent because yeah. in today's world, everyone can see that. And you've got to do it, not just because you're doing it because it, someone else is watching you. You do it because you believe it. As a, as a leader of a national, multinational company, you, you're, of course, involved with the leaders of other countries. And I know you have operations in Libya, so Muammar Gaddafi is one of the people you've run across along the way. Uh, operations in Russia, so Vladimir Putin. Have you drank vodka with Putin, by the way? Have you sat down and had vodka with him? Well, we see him, you know, twice a year maybe. Here recently, uh, that's one of the things, and uh, it, we don't, you would think that as you become a CEO in an organization that you set your schedule. Well, technically you could say, yes, you set the schedule, but if there's something that needs to be done in the company or an opportunity, and they say the CEO needs to go somewhere, or a leader in a country you know, says, we're gonna have a meeting next week or on this date, you go. Yeah. And I just had one up in Siberia, um, about 10 days ago, and seven, eight of us went and it was with uh, uh, Prime Minister Putin. So who's harder, our congressional leaders to deal with or foreign leaders to deal with? <laughs> Be careful about how I answer <laughs> that. <laughs> but actually, uh, I think when it comes down to, it's, it's very important to find a venue in a way that you can, in front, not in front of cameras or the, or the media, find a way in a venue that you can really sit down and have a substantive discussion. When you go in front of the, the Senate or whatever, uh, that's not a, a, a really a good place to get a good discussion or a debate about what the energy policy of the United States may be or whatever. Uh, but every organization, every country and all, that's one of the things that's most interesting about our industry is the people you meet and the friendships that you develop, both in countries, uh, competitors, partners, because we don't always do our own projects. In many cases, we always do it with another company, right. and we, we share and spread the risk around. Uh, it's, it's, it's just different by organization and how they do it. Uh, but the important thing is, as you said in a question earlier, is the basic principles and culture of the organization, irrespective of the country. You stay with the foundations on ethics and safety and how we do business. As you mentioned earlier, you, you travel a lot, and you, I think we were talking earlier, you were gone 180 days last year. Uh, I know you've been married for a long time, uh, and how do you balance this work schedule that you have with having a life and having a family life at the well, same time? Well, I, I have a life. <laughs> I, but my, my uh, wife and I, we've been married uh, 40 years now. We have two children that have grown up, and uh, one of them's on the faculty right. of uh, engineering here at right. University of Texas. And so, but I would say it, it's different. What I talk about myself, it's different. Each 
person has to do it in their own way that they're comfortable with. From my perspective, it's been a, a team approach. And so in the early years, I didn't travel as much and when the children were at home. And so I just would adapt the schedule. I would just get up very early in the morning, go to work, but every night I was home for dinner. And then when the travel really picked up, of course, uh, the children had gone away to school right. and university and whatever. I think the important thing is you've got to figure out what works for yourself. Uh, I spent a lot of time working and a lot of time traveling. Uh, my wife is very understanding about it. Uh, but the important thing is you've got to keep communicating, keep talking about it and working forward that we're, we're going to do this together, we're going to do that, oh, I've got to go here and go there. And she's very, very busy, and it's kind of a team approach. Right. Uh, I would say in the past, I, I used to always say I have a lot of time for any employee that works really, really hard. I still do. But when it's all said and done, uh, what's really important is uh, brain power, judgment, and so be a little more lenient and let people find their own way and their own time of how they accomplish whatever they've been asked to do. And don't try to make individuals do it the way I do it. You have to be uh, just a little bit more understanding that they have to find the right balance in how they do it. Sure. The important thing is, is I, I do, I, hard work is very important, but brain power, intelligence, judgment, and ability to work with one another and communicate, that trumps just putting in hours. Have you been able to establish policies that kind of co folks to kind of help mm -hmm. employees with, mm -hmm. as they try to balance those responsibilities? Try to, and another thing too is you, you, you have to, it just happened actually today, we, uh, individual came in, uh, uh, wife who had unfortunately, uh, there was an auto accident, the son was not really hurt, but uh, someone lost their life, not the son. Right and said, look, it's important. That this is not important, what we're doing here. What's important, you gotta go home. So there are times when family is most important and you just have to you gotta go take care of that. And there's times in the company when the family may not need it, but we, as much time, but we've gotta really get something done. And just need to have good understanding of that. Right. right. Uh, finally, I, I read through the Conical Phillips your annual report and was looking on your website, and I know, and I noticed that the company places importance in sustainable development and uh, environment, healthy environment. Kind of, how, why, how do you believe it's your responsibility as the CEO to, uh, and as the company, to worry about those kinds of things beyond just shareholder value, to also worry about uh, the environment and sustainable development? Well, we believe the basic premise, and I believe this strongly, is fossil fuels oil, gas, and coal are going to represent 80% or more of the energy needs of the world for decades to come. And the world demands and expects that we're going to have to have cleaner, more efficient use of energy. So our business is in the oil and gas business, so it's our interest to develop this cleaner and cleaner with technology than ever before because it's a license to operate. It's a license for the sustainability of the company. So that's just intellectually, you know you must do that. But then I may work for the company, but I'm also a human being. I want clean air, I want clean water. So we need to do this in this way. So we really believe in it. So it's not just a requirement of, in the public domain or whether it's a rule or regulation. We gotta do more than just meet the rules and regulation. So we gotta find ways to deliver energy that is clean, cleaner and cleaner. It's used more efficiently by in the world public domain. And it uh, has, takes out of, it takes away the, the variability in the cost that has an adverse impact on the growth of our economy and standard of living. So we, we really believe the last more than 100 years, we wouldn't have this economy of standard of living if it wasn't for our in industry. We provide energy. And we intend to do it for the next 100 years. So we need to keep adapting how to do it. So sustainability is just so important for all the reasons I mentioned. Yeah, stepping back, do you feel it's every CEO's responsibility to worry about those kinds of issues? Obviously, if they're not in the energy business, it's a little different. But still, is there a responsibility of comp public companies to broader society? To what? To the broader society. Absolutely. I mean, we are part of society. It's not companies and society, we are part of society. 
So in our, in our industry, everything, actions we do, we sometimes our investments, they take 10, 15 years before, by the time we start drilling or exploring until we get our first dollar of cash flow. And the same with people. How do you grow and develop people? So you're always looking out. Decisions that we're making today are impacting not my time, but you know the next group and whatever. And I think whatever it is, uh, whatever position we have, or even a home that we own or apartment that we have, we want to. It's just human nature. We want to pass it on in good shape, better than we had it. And I think that's the right thing to do. And we we have a responsibility to living on this planet to the next generation, next generation to. Be good stewards. Good. Well, it's time for student questions. So please step right up, and we invite your questions. I see Julia has decided she'll go first or second. And we have some coming. I guess I'm going first. Yeah, it does work. My name is Julia Jansen, hello. I was really, really interested since I saw that you are chairman and CEO at the same time. And myself, I'm coming from a different system, so I was wondering if there is ever a conflict of interest serving as of the, on the board of directors and at the same time being an executive. No, I don't think so. I thought you were, you were going to the issue whether you should split the chairman and the CEO role. Was that part of it? Part of it, yes, especially since we were talking about ethical leaderships and mm -hmm. oversight role. Well, I really do think that it's important for the, uh, the CEO of the company to be on the board of directors uh, I, because I am the only one in our company that is an employee of the company that's also a director. All other directors are independent, and we have 14 directors, so it's one out of 14. Years past, many companies had almost equal or even exactly. more inside directors, employee directors than that. That, that. that is governance has really changed. The question with respect to the to split of the chair and a CEO position. I'm a, a real firm believer that the chairman and the CEO should be one and the same. If, if, assuming, uh, and I think most of the companies do this, uh, US companies, it's a complete transparent operation. In other words, committees, audit committees, compensation committees, whatever, they have complete access to anyone in the company, any manager, whatever, and there's complete transparency going forward that they know everything, they're brief, because if you have all that transparency and all that information, then to have a chairman who is not an employee and a CEO, effectively, you're having to brief another part of the board and then that person starts working with the rest of the board, it's not terribly efficient. But if it's not transparent or if the organization is going through some really difficult times and they're not getting the information that they need, then maybe they should be split the chair of the role from the CEO. Now that's not essentially where the European and so I'll say non-US companies are, they tend to split the chairman and the CEO roles. I think the trend though, if we go th through time, the trend will be moving towards splitting the chairman and the CEO roles. I'm just giving you my, my experience. Uh, I am on the board. Uh, our board of directors encouraged me to, when I got toward the mid-60s, to get onto another company, publicly traded company board. So as to see how another company does it. Just see how another CEO does it, another board of directors. And so a little over a year ago, I went on the board of General Electric. And it's been interesting. Uh, and it's really helped. It doesn't take as much time as I might have thought. But uh, for me and for the experience that I've seen from our board of directors, they feel we have complete transparency, have all the information they need, that uh, it's not an issue. But I think the trend is moving towards split of chairman and CEO roles. Mm -hmm. Whether that's going to take place soon or five years, 10 years, but I, I think it's going to be moving in that direction. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Elwer Brun. Um, you talked about how passion and drive is important, interest. Um, do you take any special, specific actions to arouse this motivation, this drive um, in your employees? 
One of the things that uh, I try to do, and I think it served me well, is remember I, I, I commented when I went from being a CFO to a COO. One of, it was a smaller company then. It was just Phillips Petroleum then. And to really learn the operations, one of the things that I did is I said I was going to go back to every business unit. And we had you know, 20 different business units at the time, each refinery, each large geographic location and exploration production, and went out every quarter to, are we on our operating plan? How are we adapting to the business world? How are we changing? And I think what's important is the passion is I really want to learn and know the business better than I ever did as being a CFO or the financial side of the company. But I think also by doing it, it's very important. You just don't do things for show, but when you show that you really have an interest in what people are doing, and you recognize that the success is day in and day out, what's taking place in the company and what everyone's doing in the company, well, that gets passed along. And people are, I don't care who, what the academic background might be, people got, have really good intelligence and, and uh, sense of whether you're for real or you're, for, you're not. So uh, what I really say, I think what really motivates, we're all different, is a genuine interest and do it routinely and communicate. One thing that's important is you really get to know the people in the company. And I, what helped me is when people would come in later and they'd say, well, we've got to move someone and promote someone, someone retired, they'd say, well, we really think this is a candidate that ought to do it. I'd say, well, what about the candidate over here or there? And they'd say, how do you know those people? Well, you know those people by getting out and doing it. But uh, I think just demonstrating a real interest and a recognition that the company is only going to be successful by all 30,000 people working. That's how you really do it. And you just do it differently. But people are smart in, the, in an organization. They can figure out whether you really mean it or you don't. But be consistent. Thank you. Oh, one other thing I'd like to I overlook that I want to say. As an organization gets bigger, the company gets bigger, you, you can have, wherever you go, you have a town hall meeting like this. I, I could be in Indonesia, and we have 200 or 300 employees, and you get up and talk for 20 minutes, 30 minutes and about the company, what's going on, and then say whatever questions you have. That's good to do it. But now, with the uh, internet and the web, uh, I just do it, and we just simulcast. I just did one this morning. It goes up to all 30,000 employees immediately, and that's a good way. Just like we're talking here, you're interviewed and say, "Okay, we just announced dividend increase. We announced we're going to change our capital spending. What are we doing? What's going on?" You can talk to 100 people, and that's great. And do it. But you're not getting to who you need to, and so with technology we have it today, uh, it's something that you, you really need to do. And I know there's an academic institution uh, somewhere uh, talking about, it. Said, why don't you use webcast? Why don't you get out and talk to the students through a webcast? I don't know, do you do it? You're on, you'll be on a webcast. That's what the, that's no, 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 no. <laughs> what, what, what I'm saying potentially even maybe, uh, better be careful, I'm, I'm saying even like administration and faculty or whatever is a way of saying, well, here's what's going on and maybe mm -hmm. they do that or don't. But it applies to any organization. It, the quickest and best way to get the word out is yeah. use Our, technology. The media we have now just offer a lot of opportunities that weren't there before. Yeah. Hi, I'm Russell Godfrey. And uh, one of our recent assignments was to read Machiavelli's The Prince. And one of the issues discussed in that was uh, whether it's better to be feared or loved as a leader. I was wondering uh, what your opinion is on that. And if it is a, a mixture of both, how do you, how do you achieve that uh, while working? A huge what? How do you achieve that? Well. I think the, the own, it's very important for anyone in an organization and to have some very close confidants. And I, I've always had, in my time of, say, the last 10 years, uh, being a, a CEO, oh, four or five people that you can really, will challenge. We'll get in a room and we'll just argue, debate something. But it's better to do it in a room than to get out in front of the public or analysts or board of directors and not have really done your homework. And you want to have some really close confidence and say, Jim, you may be right about this, but I think you don't want to do this. This is not right. It could be a people issue. It could be uh, something else. 
You really don't want to do that. So you really have to have some, some confidence. And the other thing is, um, I'm, I, I work pretty hard, and we set pretty, pretty hard charging as to what we got to need to do and accomplish and whatever. And uh, so I also, you want to get know what are the blind spots. It's important to know personally what the blind spots are. And some of my blind spots that I have been told a lot, it's important to, to also be a good listener. Always be working, that's good advice to everyone, be a good listener because if you're talking all the time and you don't listen, you won't learn anything, you just know what you know. And so it's important to be a good, good listener. Mm -hmm. Uh, another thing that I, I get on myself is impatience. You want things done tomorrow, today. Yeah, impatience. I know I go home, if you used to, my wife would say, uh, I go home and I don't know what your knack is. I'd ask her, well, did you get something about the car? She says, you asked me over the last two weeks to do 15 things. That's the one thing I didn't do. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so you just need to know. So I come back. I think what's really important is you you need to know, uh, have some real good confidence, and be willing to accept that you, do, you don't want to get what they say is CEO-itis, and you want to be able to listen that sometimes you don't make good decisions, or you're about to make a poor decision, or you haven't considered everything, even though you think it's right. You've got to have some people that really... Mm -hmm. There was this old... This is out in Africa, someone that told me this uh, kind of story or joke. And it kind of went like this, and the young man wanted to marry the uh, king's daughter. And the uh, king says, well, you need to take, take off all your clothes. So I said, well, you're not going to marry my, wife, or my uh, daughter unless you take off all your clothes. He took off all his clothes. He said, oh, I'm not going to marry your daughter. He said, no, I don't like, I don't like your nose. <laughs> so the point is uh, you need to really listen and you really need to get some confidence and be willing to listen and talk and debate to make better decisions. But those are hard people to find, aren't they? I mean, because usually in, in organizational structures, there's a little apprehension about being honest. So in some ways, those are the hard people to find in an organization. Well, n not, not necessarily. Uh, you tend over time, you grow to, together with each other and uh, you develop these really close relationships and and now that you really do, you have to call and say, you know, I don't, I'm not so sure I got this right. Yeah. What do you think about this? And people, if they feel comfortable, that, then we do in our uh, company. They'll come in and say, I really think this, this makes no sense at all. Uh, you, you, you say, well, maybe we ought to sleep on this. We better think about sure. this some more. Uh, it's important to get it right. So, thank you. Hi, I'm Elena Rosales. Um, one of the things we have been discussing in class is uh, the fact that um, uh, som sometimes whatever we see as ethical in the United States and what we see as unethical may be different in other country. And uh, uh, how do you think, uh, how do you feel about this? And uh, um, do you think a big corporation, international corporation has to adapt to the uh, ethical perspectives of other cultures or stick to its values? First, we do need to, wherever we go in the world, we need to adapt to the culture of the country and how we actually do business and work. And so as an international company, it's very important for us that I would say nationalize. So if we go to China, we want to be working towards 100% um, of the employees through all levels of the organization are Chinese or non-American to some extent, get a diversified workforce. And then we like to see in the United States our management, their leadership structure come from all over different parts of the world. So we need to try not to instill where we go that this is how we do things in the United States. Now we need to understand that, but we do not compromise the principles of safety and we do not compromise the principles of, of ethics. And I can tell you that uh, p different parts of the world are not real pleased when the U.S. says sanctions or this is how we do business. Uh, George and I were talking about this uh, earlier. Uh, we as a company have walked away from, over the years, quite a number of very interesting and good investment opportunities. 
but they had aspects attached to them that may or may not be uh, not in accordance with the laws of the United States, or even if they were in accordance with the laws of the United States, they don't look or feel right. You just don't do them. You just walk away from them. That goes back to the uh, walk the talk. So we want to adapt to the local customs and how we live and do business. That's important because you won't attract the talent. When it comes down to safety and ethics, there's no compromise. Thank you. And by the way, we may pass up on some opportunities and have good, great investment opportunities. In the end, I think it serves us well. Mm -hmm. Their, their reputation that you, in, that you have as an ethical leader is of value. In an ethical company, these are things of value. But George, you, you raise a real important thing, and I, and I have uh, thought about this a lot. For many years, I used to say, uh, if you don't have health or integrity, you don't have a lot to offer people, really, mm -hmm. when you think about mm -hmm. it. Well, I've kind of modified that a little bit, because there are people who are terminal who don't have good health, that have an incredible things that they can offer uh, to us. So I'm more careful when I say if you don't have health and integrity, you don't have, but you, you understand sure. what, I'm, what sure. I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. So reputation, reputation of us individually as an, or, and as an organization is. You can, it takes a long time to, to instill it and get it, but you can lose it quickly. And I would, bet there have been opportunities that have come to you because of your reputation for how you do your business. Yeah, uh, opportunities have come and we just said we really would like to do this. Can we find a way to do it? And we just know and we pass and someone else does it. No, I'm sorry. What, what I meant is I have opportunities come to you because of the positive oh, yeah. reputation yeah. that you have for running an ethical business. Yeah. People would say, I'd like you to be a partner because it's very transparent. I know what I'm going to get. And there's another aspect, too, and we talk about ethics. It's not just ethics on investment and opportunities. There's also an ethic question of how we communicate and talk about one another. I mean, just think about it, ethically. Mm -hmm. You can be and you say, well, we have another employee or individual or partner or whatever. Well, what do you think about that individual? You better be ethical on your comments because that goes, that's another point of ethics. Uh, I'm not getting into gossip or that, but that has a lot of impact on right. people. So it's not just investment ethics in accordance with the law, but we have to also think that goes to how we treat and talk about individuals. I think that's important. See, hi, my name is Jeff Siegel. Um, my question is actually, so ConocoPhillips was created through the merger of Phillips and Conoco. And if I recall your biography correctly, you were the CEO of Phillips prior to the merger. Um, a lot of times we see in a lot of these mergers, it's difficult uh, to merge two companies with a different culture. Um, clearly, you've talked about your passion and your intensity and your focus, and that was uh, you know, within Phillips. How were you able to uh, get people within Conoco to buy into that vision. Um, clearly they have as, you know, you're still the CEO and chairman of the, the merged entity. Um, what have been some of the, the challenges and what have been like some of the successes that you've had? Well, I really have to say I underestimated the challenge of the culture of putting companies together. But in our case, it's been actually 10 years the creation of this company because uh, you may recall that uh, BP acquired ARCO. And to be able to acquire Arco, Arco was forced to divest the jewel in the portfolio, which is all their operations and investments in Alaska, and Phillips bought it. Uh, we bought Tosco, which was the largest independent refiner company. We've done mergers. We acquired Burlington. We, so it's not just the merger of Conoco and Phillips. We find that we have cultures from Arco Phillips, Conoco, and Tosco was made up of refineries that came from BP, Shell, Unical, um, I'm, I'm missing one or two, uh, Burlington, and then we've done joint ventures with the independent company in Canada from Canada. So we got many different cultures, and some, in some respects it's a bit of a social experiment because we all come from a minority representation. 
And it is true from a governance point of view, the governance, governance of how you actually run the company, uh, a lot comes from the CEO. And so the governance of the company is what you're accustomed to, it looks a lot probably for like the old Phillips. But I can recall at the time of the merger for about 18 months to two years, you just have to say, unless there's a fatal flaw in what we're doing, this is where we're going. Because if you stop every other day to reinvent the wheel, it, you will not be successful. So it's been, we underestimate, I would say, we, I underestimated the challenge of taking people and employees when you have your fierce competitors and all of a sudden you're, you're, you're all one in the same company. Uh, and employees that work 40 years, 30 years, and 20 years, it's hard to say we're going to do things differently. Mm -hmm. So that's why I've really learned over time, when I said earlier, the importance is the opportunities, investment decisions, and people, and financial resources, and technology. The culture is so important. And that was the toughest challenge. Oh, what did you do to overcome that challenge? You just keep working it. Uh, what happens is over time, the important thing is the employees buy in when they become convinced that the merged company is stronger, better, with more opportunities and value creation than not being merged. You, you intellectually have to buy into that. Some people with time just self-eject. It just doesn't fit them. I don't know if it's 10% or 15%. New employees come in and they into the company and they can see, well, hey, I, I just work for Conical Phil. I don't understand the heritage of 20 years here and 30 years there. They see it, but it just takes time. And then once the company becomes quite you know, successful, uh, it tends to uh, the understanding that this combined company is stronger and better than it would have been if it was not combined. That's where you get buy-in. All right, thank you very much. Well, please join with me in thanking Jim for being with us today. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> really appreciate it. And we'll see you if you'd like to join us on October 29th. Again, thank you. Thanks, Jim. That was great.